Aren't you glad that God's mercies endure forever? Amen. Forever and ever. It is because of his mercies that we are not consumed. Amen. It's because of his mercy that he looks beyond my faults and he sees my needs. I thank God for his mercy. Amen. Amen. We praise God for this choir. Each who have led in ministry. Amen. Through song and in worship. Give thanks. Amen. I want to call your attention, either in your bulletin or your Bible, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. When you've got it, say, I've got it. Amen. Let's stand to our feet for the reading of the word. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set out. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set out. Amen. Do me a favor and touch a few people around you and just say, let me clear my throat. Every now and then, the circumstance or the situation requires that what is said is said in such a way that no one can mistake it. It has to be emphatic, it has to be direct, it has to be concise, and it has to be clear. And so, generations ago, one might say, I've got to clear my throat or let me clear my throat. It was a statement saying that what I'm getting ready to say is absolute. I don't care how you feel about it. I don't care if you agree with it. It's the truth and it will stand. I understand that we might differ on this matter, but right, this right here, right here, right here, it's just what I said it is. Now, I might be negotiable, I might be even pensive and sometimes passive about many things, but this right here, there's no uncertainty in my tone. There's no uncertainty in my walk. There's no ambiguity in my heart. There's clarity in my mind. There's conviction in my soul. There's assurance in my heart. I know I'm certain. I, no, 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 no. Get this right here. There's no question. This was the stance that the three Hebrew boys took. We're familiar with the context. We're in a series on favor. And I've come by first to make it clear that favor does not mean that everything will always seem favorable. But favor, in fact, means that God will sometimes allow you to be set up so that you can show the world, almost like show and tell. You remember the teacher would say you can bring something in. You would go home and find that thing that you appreciated the most and you would bring it into the classroom and you would present it and explain it to the class. Well, sometimes when you've been favored, God says, give me this opportunity to use you as an example. That doesn't mean that it's comfortable 
That doesn't mean that it's enjoyable, but God wants others to see in you what he can do. So he allows unfavorable circumstances to come your way only so that you can show the world who you are and who the God is that you serve. And so now the three Hebrew boys, having before Daniel gave declaration of an image. It, this image was different. This image was not all gold, but this image had four major parts. One might even argue five major parts. But if you remember, the first of the major part was the one that represented Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar. And so it was gold. Well, Nebuchadnezzar responds to that image that he dreamed of from God, that vision that he had from God, decided he would up God. He decided, I'm not going to have an image that's only partial gold, but I want God to know, because that represented his kingdom, that my kingdom will last forever. So he built a different image, but this one was complete gold. Can you imagine the audacity to stand in the face of God and tell God what you're going to do and how you're going to do it? Yeah, some of us do that now. Tell God what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, and how you're going to do it. This is what happened, and in response, every single person was to bow. Now remember before when Daniel gave the interpretation, that was a more private conversation. Only those who knew the inner parts of the kingdom, only the governors and the mayors and the satraps and those who were on the inside knew the story. But this scene is different because now Nebuchadnezzar calls everyone to attention. He says, excuse me, excuse me, all of you all, we're going to bow at this image. Image. We're going to bow at this image when the music plays. And when the music plays, we're all going to fall down and worship. Can you see everybody together joining, pausing, and bowing for worship? All kinds of people bowed. Old people bowed, young people bowed, rich people bowed, poor people. There was a whole lot of bowing going on. But then out of the corner of their eyes, there was somebody and some folk who saw four people, who saw four people, I say four, who saw four people who who refused to bow. And the three that became the subject of the conversation were the three Hebrew boys. And so the announcement went out. Did you hear that the three Hebrew boys, they didn't bow? I don't know if you've ever been the one that didn't do what everyone else did and people started talking about you. It'd be one thing for them to say, I'm going to bow and you're not going to bow and just leave you alone. But it's strange when you decide to do what you know God has called you to do, somebody's got to talk about you. And I told you before, if if you're going to stand out or if you're going to be outstanding, you're going to stand out. It's true here. The three Hebrew boys now are standing out. They can't hide in the crowd because they're standing up while others are bowing down. And so now Nebuchadnezzar gets the word. He says, excuse me, are you telling me that there are three people who refuse to do what I tell them to do? Don't they know I'm King Nebuchadnezzar? Don't they know that that's my image? Don't they know that all of us got to worship that image? And at that, he had another respect for the three Hebrew boys to call them to attention. He said, excuse me, gentlemen, I got to be straight with you. You know, I like you. You know, you're my friends. You know, we, we hang out together. I like your kind of people. You're good people. Now, let me talk to you for a, mu for a minute about this image. You know, if you don't bow, there'll be trouble. In fact, all I'm asking you to bow, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to like it, but just bow. And after you bow, you can go along your way. Everything will be all right. And at that, they said, <clears throat> king, king. King, King, let me let you know that we've thought about this thing. Let me let you know that we're not wavering on this thing. Let me let you know that we understand the situation and the scenario we're in. But we have a conviction and we know that conviction comes with cost. So whatever happens to us, we're not bowing. I thought this was such a powerful imagery of these three Hebrew boys with this such great conviction. I thought about how they took this stand. But do you realize after I prayed on this text and I looked on this text God said that's not all I want the people of Shiloh to see yes they're impressive but that's not and they're not the only people who cleared their throat check out the text because not only did these three Hebrew boys clear their throat and say I've got something to say but look all the way up God in heaven said when my sons when my daughters when my people decide to take a stand for me then I'll take a stand for them God decided <clears throat> wait a minute shut up Nebuchadnezzar be 
quiet three Hebrew boys. It's now time for me to speak. And notice, he didn't say anything with his words, but he said something with his actions. Can I show you in the text? The major theme of this text and the major question that's answered right before this verse 18 and verse 17, who is this God? Who is this God that's going to be able to save you from the fiery furnace? That's the major question. And here's the major answer. It's the idea that God speaks up and now speaks for himself. God says, I want to let you know that I am a zealous God of my own. One could argue a jealous God, but we don't use the term the same way. God here is arguing that he's zealous about some things. And let me show you in the text what God is arguing for. God is saying, first, I want you to know that I, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, I to the world, and I even to you, he's saying, I am zealous. Oh, y'all don't understand what zealous means. My bad. Let me back that thing up. The reality is that to be zealous means to be particular in such a way that it seems excessive. Okay, uh, we just had a newborn baby, and whenever I walk in the room and go to pick up my baby, the first thing my wife does is she says, did you wash your hands? She says, is your shirt clean? I said, cool, baby. Let me just give my baby a kiss. She said, no, go brush your teeth again. You're not going to kiss the baby. Yeah. She's zealous. She doesn't want anybody to hold the baby. She doesn't want anybody to make any noise. She says, turn the TV off. I said, the baby's not asleep. That's okay. Turn it off. Be quiet. Watch out. Back up. She's zealous over the, that baby girl. She's zealous over my daughter, Kimberly. And that's the truth about God. God is zealous over some things. Let me show you what he's zealous over first. First, this text teaches us that God is zealous over his word. Okay, y'all didn't see it. I'll show you in the text. Help me out. Say it. God is zealous over his word. Notice, notice that the three Hebrew boys made a comment or a commitment or a statement about what their God can do. And at that, God steps in and says, you're absolutely right. That's what I said I would do. In fact, it's in Isaiah. In Isaiah 43, Isaiah says, you'll go through the waters, but they won't overtake you. You'll go through the fires, but they won't consume you. God knew this was going to happen. And so in his word, he said, I'm going to take care of you. God's word said it. And even, okay, let me give you another one. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. It says that God watches over his word to make sure it accomplishes what he sent it out to. God watches over his word. So you need to understand that God incidentally had given Jeremiah a word in his heart, a word in his spirit. And God wanted Jeremiah to know that that was from me and I'll see to it that it takes place. Can I talk to you, Shiloh? Come here. Somebody whose child is going through. You need to know God has given you a word on their life. Somebody who has a health condition. You need to know God has given you a word on your life. Somebody needs to know that God still has promises. God still has words. God still has commitments. God still has commands. And he's literally watching over those to make sure, first, to make sure that they come to pass. That's a matter of assurance. God is saying, I will see to it that whatever I told you happens. Okay, I feel like bragging. Let me call it testifying. I'll never forget. We had tried and tried to have a baby. We had lost babies. We really wanted a baby. It was our heart's desire. We went to doctor after doctor. They did all sorts of strings. I mean, strange things. I mean, okay, bad things. I mean, all sorts of doctors. One doctor even had given a grandmother her grandbaby's daughters in her womb. So we thought he could help us. He said, I can't help you. We went to every doctor. And then one day, I promise you this is a true story. My wife came to me and said, honey, last night, God gave me a word. God said, this time tomorrow, you'll be with a child. Mm, yeah. God said, this time tomorrow, you'll be with a child. And I'll never forget thinking, oh, okay. But look, God kept his word word and God's completed his word. That's why we have seven children right now because God doesn't just keep his word, but God wants you to know that he really keeps his word. If he tells you something, you can count on it. If he tells you there's a promotion in your future, you can count on it. If he tells you you can get clean, you can count on it. If he tells you your finances will get better, you can count on it. Whatever God tells you, he watches over his word and that's a matter of a assurance. But it's not just assurance. I believe God watches over his word in anticipation. 
Okay, y'all missing that. You know, as a father, as a father, my daughter Gracie, she can cook. Now, I know she's young. I know she doesn't look like it. She can do a whole lot, but she can bake. She can broil. She can fricassee. She can cook. My daughter can cook, and now we let her cook, and we sort of watch to see what she's going to put together, and at the end, I know whatever she puts together is, together is going to be good. Do you know when God sends his word out, he watches not just in assurance, but to say, I told you it was going to be good. God said, I told you I'd let you build the building. God said, I told you I'd let you get a husband. God said, I told you I'd let you get a wife. And she's good, isn't she? Amen. All I'm trying to say is God watches over his word in a zealous way. So whatever God has told you, you better hold on to it. You better, in fact, that verse in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, it starts off by talking about a tree. It talks about an almond tree. And the interesting thing about an almond tree is an almond tree blossoms in various times in various ways. In fact, it blossoms with little white leaves in the winter in snow time. So even when it's snowing and you don't think you'll see anything, God says, if you look carefully, I want to show you something. Come here, somebody. I need you to get this because God wants you to know no matter what the enemy says, God wants you to know no matter what the circumstance is, God wants you to know no matter how bad the heartache is right now that I've got something in your future you just gotta believe my word okay let me continue God wants us to know that his word will come to pass I don't know if you know the the name David Walker David Walker his parents was a slave but he was born free and he has uh, born free in time of slavery he said I've got to move out the south I can't watch this and when he got to Boston he began to write arguments or an appeal an appeal against slavery it was a legal appeal and a biblical appeal and he systematically broke down while while slavery was not right and he then took those words in a pamphlet and he called it the David Walker appeal and he sold it and stitched it into clothing and sent it south and he sent it to everybody even and especially the slave masters because he wanted them to know that he knew and others knew that it what wasn't right his words were so significant it started the abolition abolitionist movement and I want you to know in a very real sense God's word is so significant in your life if you get his word and hold on to his word it'll abolish something that needs to be abolished in your life okay y'all not feeling me I don't know what the temptation is but you need to get a word because the Bible says no temptation has come upon you except that which is common to man I don't know what the need is I don't know where there's poverty but you need to get the word my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory I don't know what the discour discouragement is or the depression is but the bible says i'll turn beauty in for ashes or ashes in for beauty whatever the circumstance you just need to get some word and stand on it and hold on it keep it in your pocket every now and then god will show you his word will come true i gotta move on god gave me a word man i feel this thing god gave me a word as a young man i knew i was called to preach early on and god said all you got to do is prepare and so I used to walk around with my wallet but in my wallet I didn't have any money I used to have little sheets of papers with sermons on them and every now and then God said if you prepare I'll give you an opportunity I'll never forget my pastor saying so-and-so can't preach today do you want to preach I said yes I do I had a word and I stood on it and God gave me opportunity can I talk to you you need to get a word for your circumstance and God will bless it because he's zealous over his word. That's the first thing that these three Hebrews boys teach us that God is zealous over the stuff he told you, over the stuff he showed you. He means it. But not only is God zealous over his word, but God is zealous over his worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talk about worship a lot here because worship is serious to God. God takes worship so serious that he's jealous over worship. 
that God doesn't want you worshiping anything else. I got to warn some of us who are passive. I got to warn some of us who are still. I got to warn some of us who are stoic. Be careful because if God sees you dancing in a few minutes in front of a football screen and you sitting in church looking sophisticated, he begins to wonder, how can you be so excited about that team? They didn't feed you. They didn't wake you. They didn't rock you to sleep. They didn't forgive you. I did that. Every now and then, God says, why don't you show me how excited you are about me? I dare you to open up your mouth and show God, God, you're worthy of all my worship. Not just here, but anywhere. I dare you to have a heart that says, I want to worship the Lord. I want to worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. I want all my friends to know. I want my Mormon friends to know. I want my Muslim friends to know. I want my Buddhist friends to know. I want everybody to know that I love the Lord. I'm not ashamed of him. I'm not hating on you, but I love God because he heard my cry and pitied every groan. I love God because he keeps me when no one else can keep me, and he deserves all Oh, my worship. In fact, I owe him a debt. Forgive me. Let me worship him right now. For being so good when I think about health and strength when I think about protecting my children when I think about keeping my wife when I think about what he's already done for me I can't help but worship him I gotta worship him because he's worthy of all my worship he's so worthy sometimes I just gotta pause I sometimes I gotta pull the car over sometimes in the shower I gotta cry before him because he's worthy of all our worship and he's jealous for our worship I gotta be honest because the temptation is to think that worship is always going to be inner, quiet, and silent. But that is not the example that's set before us in the scriptures. In fact, it was Minister Johnson who asked the question, what does rejoice mean? Minister Johnson, I wanna let you know the Hebrew, the Hebrew Old Testament meaning for rejoice literally meant not to stand still, not to wave your hands, not to say thank you God, but it literally meant to jump up and down. So the next time you're sitting in church and you see this brown brother jumping up and down, don't be mad at me. I'm just worshiping God because he's been so good to me. I'm just worshiping God because he's opened doors for me. I'm just worshiping God. I've got to give him a total praise. They understood that we can't worship anything else. I'm sorry, lesser king. We can't worship your lowercase God because we've got a greater God who is perfect, who's omnipotent, who's all powerful, who gave you the gifts and the strength to build this little image that you built. So we don't want to be disrespectful, but we've got to give credit. We've got to give honor. We've got to give praise to our God. All our praise goes to our God. Every word of worship goes to our God. That's the truth. And that's why we worship God alone. You need to know that God is serious about his worship. If I had time and I didn't want to offend you too bad, I'd talk to you about my love life. Yeah, I got a wonderful wife, and I do. I love my wife, and I love you. But if I ever see you kissing on her cheek or hugging her too long, I want to let you know that I'm going to get a little offended because that's my wife. Let me move on. Not only... Amen. You got to learn to laugh. Not only is God zealous over his word, but God is also zealous over his worship. But look at the text because here's the major move of the text and it ought to encourage you. Look, God is zealous over his worshipers. Oh, you missed that. That's you and that's me. God is zealous over us. He says, they're my children. And so here in the text, Nebuchadnezzar does what he can do. He does what he promised he would do. And what he did was a bad thing. He had a furnace. He was a fiery, it was a fiery furnace. He threw them in. He had somebody throw them in. And the people who threw them in were consumed. But look what happened to his worshipers. His worshipers were in the fire but the fire didn't get to them. Now, you got to get this because you, like me, we say, God, would you keep me from it? God, would you let it not happen? God, would you let it go easy? God, would you let it not destroy me? God, would you let me not go through it? I don't want to go through it. And God says, that's okay. This time, you've got to go through it. But when you go through it, it won't destroy you. It might be traumatic. It might be hard. It might even hurt. But it won't be fatal. You can go through it, and you'll go through it with your chin 
looking up with your eyes open, with a smile on your face. And people will ask you how you're able to do what you do when you do what you do. And you'll say, God keeps on keeping me. God keeps on blessing me. That's the testimony of our text. That God says, because you're a worshiper, I'm committed to you. I'm zealous over you. I'm going to make sure that nothing happens to you. You ought to tell people who mess with you. I'm not trying to cause trouble here, but I want to let you know my father won't like this. And when my father sees stuff, I don't know if you watch movies. I'm a movie buff. I'm a movie buff. I truly am. Yeah. And a little help from Hollywood. There's this wonderful movie called Den of Thieves. Uh, everybody shouldn't watch it. You might be too holy for it, but called Den of Thieves. And it's about this gang of robbers. And this gang of robbers, they're all buff and tattooed and, and big like me and big and strong. And look, uh, th th there's a scene in the, in the movie where they stop robbing and they all go to one man's house. And in his house, it's very serene. It's very sophisticated. And there you see his daughter. She's getting ready to go to the prom. He had all his friends, all the robbers who had just finished doing time, hanging out in the garage. He says to the young man, he said, young man, you're getting ready to take my daughter to the prom. Can I speak to you for a moment? He takes the young man into the garage. And there you see him lifting weights. They all look mean. In fact, some of them are ground. <clears throat> And he says, young man, I don't want to do to you what I can do to you. But if anything happens to my daughter and if she is late by one second or one minute, I'm going to have to harm you in very bad ways. And at that, the man trembles, the boy trembles and he walks away. Well, can I talk to you for a moment? God in heaven is something like that. He says, be careful how you treat my child. I don't know your name from here and I can't say all your names, but do me a favor and just say your name. Be careful how you treat Hodari Hamilton. Yeah, say your name. See, some of y'all didn't do it. Be careful how you treat. Because you got to understand that God is zealous over you. God watches over you. God makes sure that you are preserved and you are protected. I got to go. One of the greatest preachers of our era was a brother named Gardner C. Taylor. He was from Louisiana. Gardner C. Taylor was a brilliant mind. I had the chance to meet him a few times at Virginia Union. A brilliant mind, even in his 80s. I remember hearing, hearing him share his testimony. How as a young man, he was driving in Louisiana. He was driving in Louisiana on a rainy night. The rain was coming and pounding and as he drove, he hit someone. He heard the thump. He did everything he could and he recognized that he had literally hit someone. When he got out of the car, he knew he had hit someone. And the first thing he said, and it was a white man. He knew in Louisiana, he was going to get the death penalty for killing this man. He went to court months later and while sitting in court, he was there and God had told him, if you preach my gospel, I'll take care of you. He determined that he would become a preacher at that point. True story. Check it out. He determined he would become a preacher. And while he was sitting there, the, 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 the jury didn't look like him. There was no one in the jury who looked like him. He knew that he was going to be in trouble. But just at that, somebody walked in the courthouse. They went to the attorney and they said, I need to say a word. Another man, another white brother came forward and said, I've got to testify on his behalf. This man ran in front of him and there was nothing he could do. It wasn't his fault. He got off. And because he got off, because of that word, he forever went around preaching the word of God. I don't know what court situation you got to face, but I want you to know if God has to send somebody in the courtroom, somebody you've never met before, somebody who doesn't look like you, somebody who you haven't talked with or talked to, God says, I'm going to take care of you because you are mine. You're my child. I'll take care of you. I have something particular for my worshipers. I protect them, but not only do I protect them, God wants you to know that he's going to be with you. I know I'm in the Bible because the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar, he threw these three in. And as he threw these three in, he had to look at the fiery furnace and say, something's not right. Didn't we throw three in? One, two, three, four. And the fourth looks like somebody special. He looks like the son of man. That's got to be the son of God. The next time you have to go into fire, the next time you have to go into trouble, the next time you have to go into a courtroom, the next time you have to go into a sick room, the next time you have to go into a boardroom, 
the next time remember no matter what the circumstance is no matter how bad it looks no matter how bad it seems you might have gasoline on your drawers but go in that courtroom knowing that your God has promised to be with you and as long as he is with you no harm can overtake you no hurt can take you down no pain can take you out he says I'll be your God I am with you I am for you if I be for you who can be against you if I be for you who can stop you the answer nobody 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 the Bible says that God takes care of his worshipers. Look at the text because all of us are just like the three Hebrew boys. All of us were destined for fire. But because of a declaration, God has says, I'll keep you through the fire and through the flood. You are mine. I am yours. You are kept. In fact, you can sing a song that the angels cannot sing. I am redeemed bought with the price I am redeemed I am redeemed do you know what that means I am not perfect but I have been redeemed hallelujah praise God I dare you to stand up on your feet and give God a praise I dare you to declare the goodness of our God I dare you to say he is a God like no other God only our God can keep us. I dare you to be a little uncomfortable and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. I dare you to say no rock will cry out in my place when I think about the goodness of Jesus and everything, a few things or just one thing he's done for me. It makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. You keep on blessing me. You keep on 